Shall we begin with a prayer together? Yes. Yes. Pray together. All right. Uh, thank you, God, for the opportunity to, to sit here with the riches of your word in our hands. Uh, we pray, God, that those riches would transfer themselves from the printed page in front of us into our hearts and our minds, uh, helping us to think more like Christ and to uh, live in a way that pleases you and honors what he's done for us. And we pray, God, as we particularly talk about the theme of fullness tonight, that you'll teach us what that means and help us to live within that fullness, uh, satisfied with all that you are, so that we can show the world uh, what, well, not just what they're missing, but, but what's possible uh, with what we have in Christ. Thank you for this opportunity tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Fullness. Do you like being full? Yes. Well, I, I certainly like not being hungry, I can tell you that. I uh, had a very long day today, as I expect many of you did. Uh, I went to a funeral in Leicester, uh, lunchtime today. My father's cousin died uh, recently, and uh, so my father was actually involved in the ceremony today. <coughs> How about that? That's what and uh, so I drove up to Leicester and, uh, and, and came back and uh, uh, down straight down to here. And uh, it's good to see all of you after being in a funeral, I have to say. It's, it's just good to be amongst Aww. brothers and sisters and uh, be able to share this time together. But after a long day of driving, I was ready for some food. I had to, went, ended up here a little bit early. I went to the harvester Ooh. and it was a 45 minute wait Excellent. for food. <laughs> So uh, I was dissatisfied with that situation and, and, and uh, came here early and I, get, and I got a burger uh, in 10 minutes. There you go. So uh, I feel reasonably full. Uh, but we're not talking about that kind of fullness tonight. We're talking about something a little more significant and uh, deep, shall we say. Where are we, in, where are we in our look at the book of Colossians so far? The first class we talked about the supremacy of the Son of God. He is supreme. We looked at, essentially, the identity of Jesus Christ. And, to, and then in the second class, we looked at what it meant to serve the Son of God, serving the Son of God, Paul's intentions in why he wrote the letter. He wanted to help the people in Colossae to serve Jesus well, considering what they've been given. And tonight, we're talking about fullness, which I think is, in a sense, God's goal for us in Christ. What does God want for us? We've looked at what who Christ is. We'll talk a bit more about that tonight. We've looked at what Paul's hopes are for the Colossians. But what's God's goal for you and I? And that's what we're going to look at here. So let's go to the passage of Colossians 2, and we'll read from verse 6 down to verse 15. It says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ... All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head of every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ, with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our um, 
Having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. It's a fantastic passage. I mean, I just, uh, there's so much we could talk about tonight, we could be here a while. So you've got to hand out a few extra scriptures, a few extra points. You can use that for your own quiet time, a bit more of your own study. But where are we now? I think we're at the hinge of the book. We're kind of in the middle of the book of Colossians, not just, if you like, physically within the text. But I think the heart of Paul's message, what he's trying to get across, is right here in verses 6 and 7. As you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Continue. You've started, you've gone somewhere, now continue with it. And continue with it, rooted, built up, strengthened, overflowing. We've got a lot of different terms there that describe the way that we walk, that we live, and we feel, and we express our faith. And, and Paul's really got to the, the goal of, of what's going on here, God's goal. God's goal is that we continue to live. The continue to live there is the word walk. It's a, it's a perambulation. It's the word where the word perambulate comes from in the Greek. It's a walking around. It's a walking uh, hither and thither. And so we're walking in Christ. You remember 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. If you go, go on, flip over there quick with me or do, do something clever with your iPhone or whatever you have there. 1 John 2, 6. That's on your handout. Um, verse 5. If anyone obeys God, his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did, or some translations will say, must walk as Jesus did. In biblical terms, New Testament, but also Old Testament, in Jewish thinking, it's the same idea. The word walk, the word live, go together. And Galatians 5.16, which you can look up later in the world, has the same idea. So it's a way of life. Christianity is not just a way of thinking. It's not just about doctrinal accuracy or knowledge. It's the way that that knowledge and accepting it affects the way we live day to day. Yeah. We all know that. But if, if the Colossians needed reminding of that, probably we do from time to time too. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. And so it's about that. And he says you're rooted. The word rooted there is in the past tense. So he's saying you've been rooted. It's like when a tree is rooted, it's, well, it's just rooted. And those roots are often really large. We, had, we moved into our house a year and a half ago, and our next door neighbor had an enormous spruce tree in their garden, I mean, it was, I don't know how high it was, and the, and the garden's not that long, and the houses aren't that tall. Perhaps most of the houses in our street are bungalows, they're not even two stories. And this enormous spruce tree overshadowed the whole garden, and uh, it was right by where our vegetable patch is. And that's a problem, because no rain fell on the vegetable patch, because it was sheltered by this tree. Uh, all the roots were going into the vegetable patch, and there was no water, it was all being sucked up by the spruce tree. There were roots everywhere, so digging around there was a problem, and the sun was blocked as well. So actually it's the exact illogical place to have a vegetable patch, but it was there when we moved in. And then our neighbour said, well, chop it down. And you know when your neighbours tell you something good, but you don't want to sound too excited, because then you, they'd be like, oh, you really hated that tree. You know, we've been annoying you forever. But anyway, they said they'd chop it down, and we said, oh, that's really nice, but if you want to, that's fine by us. And they had the thing chopped down, and there was, there was a van load of men on that tree all day, up and down with their chainsaws and ladders and ropes, pulling this thing down, and now there is blessed light <laughs> just flowing in. But the point, the point, the roots are still there, even the dead ones. And it's, I was digging in the garden on Wednesday, and I, you know, I was putting the, the spade in here. No, there's some huge root, put the spade in it. The, the roots are big. I mean, I will dig them up in time. We are so deeply rooted in Christ already by what he has done, we are secure. We'll talk more about that as we go through this passage. But that's been done. This is a special message for those of us who feel insecure in our faith. It's not about you. It's about what Christ has done in you. You are rooted in him. You say, I don't feel rooted in him. That's okay. The roots you have are not dependent on your feelings. True. Your feelings, be honest about your feelings and be real about your feelings. That's fine. But your, your, your destiny in Christ, your, your destiny with God forever is not dependent on those feelings. It's about the fact that you have been rooted in Christ. So that's what Christ has already done. And then the other things are continuing. The verse tenses are present and future. Built up, we're being built up in him. We're not yet all that we will be. We're not yet all of what Christ has planned for us. We're not yet all of what we hope to be in Christ. 
but we are being built up. And they, the foundations are done, but the roots are there. Now there's some growing to do. Maybe like the spruce tree, which apparently was a, a, a discarded Christmas tree. And our neighbors told us that it was a Christmas tree that was planted decades ago. That after Christmas, they just stuck it out there. And I wasn't sure whether to believe them. But I spoke to a neighbor opposite who's lived in, the, in that house 40 odd years. And I said, they're taking a spruce tree down. I was really excited. And she said, yes, it was planted as a Christmas tree after one Christmas. I was like, you're kidding. So some little six foot tall Christmas tree dominated our entire garden. It's enormous. It was enormous, this thing. And, and so, but it, it grew bit by bit, right? We grow bit by bit. The roots are already there. They're drawing in the nutrients from Christ, but we are being built up. That's a great thing about the Christian life. We're not the finished article. Next year, or even this year, or even possibly next week, or even possibly tomorrow, Saturday, is going to be one of the most exciting days in your Christian life because you're going to be growing and learning and becoming more and more like Christ. So we are rooted already. We are being built up, and then also, uh, what are the other words here, strengthened in the faith. We're continuing to be strengthened. I was in the uh, lobby earlier, and some, of, some, some gorillas walk past me. You know the chaps who spend all day in the gym, and, and people who can't walk, unless their arms are out here. And I, I said, wrong with that, if that's what people are into. But, you know, they're, in, they're, they're, being, they're building up their bodies, and some of us perhaps are doing the same thing. But we, as Christians, we're building up our soul. We're building up our spiritual strength, maybe, is the best way to look at it. We're being strengthened in the faith. And uh, what else does he say? We are then uh, in the faith that we were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Now, you see, there, there is the fruit of all of that. The roots, the, the building up, the strengthening. What, what's the consequence of that, of being in Christ, is that we overflow with thankfulness. I think this is at the heart of the letter. Uh, as we... Now look into the challenges that the, the Colossians had of being attracted to other thinking and philosophy and teaching and traditions. Uh, a, a lot of what Paul is really saying is it's about your thankfulness. I, I think you've got a problem with thankfulness, Colossians. Now I love the way that Paul does this. Because what Paul doesn't do is he doesn't write a letter which is basically three lines long and say, Colossians, you guys need to repent of your ingratitude to Christ. Love the Apostle Paul. He, he doesn't make it as, as bald, bald and bare as that. He, he wants them to understand what produces the thankfulness. And I think this is very important as we study the Bible, and particularly the book of Colossians, that we read it from the perspective of how, what, am I going, what am I learning here that's helping me to become someone who is characterized by overflowing with thankfulness. And it's a good question to ask of these scriptures as we do this. When we're overflowing, then the, one of the great, I, there's a bad side of overflowing and a good side. The bad side is when you're carrying a hot cup of coffee and it overflows with coffee and you scald your fingers. That's not so good. But the good thing about overflowing is it gets noticed. Mm. People who overflow get things that overflow, like overflowing bath, an overflowing sink, and overflow, anything overflowing gets noticed. Well, People who are Christians who overflow with thankfulness get noticed. I think that when overflowing with thankfulness is one of the great causes or contributors to effective evangelism. Yeah. Think about this for a minute. Overflowing is a cause. Overflowing with thankfulness is a cause of evangelism, a cause of effective evangelism, a cause of becoming and being and living an evangelistic lifestyle. We often talk about this kind of thing, and I think it's right that we should. But one of the interesting things about the, the New Testament is it describes evangelism, but it, and it, it, didn't, it gives us the picture of it, but it doesn't often teach us a lot about the detail of how or exactly what it is. But what the Bible does do is it gives us reasons to overflow with thankfulness, knowing that if we overflow with thankfulness, frankly, evangelism will be taken care of. Because when you're overflowing with thankfulness, it just spills out. Yeah. Am, I, am I making sense here? Yeah. And I, I, I think it's generally a healthy... I mean, we need reminders about evangelistic lifestyle. I need a reminder, and sometimes I get into myself, or I get self-focused, or I get caught up in my own problems and I lose the big picture, I forget what Christ has done, I need people calling me to that. But I think also we, we have a, uh, an opportunity to help one another 
to look at the, what helps cause evangelism. When, and if we talk more about how can we help one another to overflow with thankfulness, we will therefore also be helping one another to be evangelistic. Yeah. And I think Jesus worked that way with his disciples so much. And I think we see it in the way that Paul writes, not only here, but in many of his other letters. So that's his goal. I think that's God's goal, that they are not only rooted, but that they're built up, strengthened, and overflowing with thankfulness. What's the problem? That sounds fine, but the problem is verse 8, isn't it? See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. There he's harking back to something he said um, earlier in verse 4, we looked at in the last class, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. A similar idea. He's concerned about this. The problem, <clears throat> there's a potential problem, which is that they could be taken captive. A prisoner of war. I can't think of anything much worse at the moment than being taken captive by Boko Haram or Islamic State. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because effectively, that's pretty much a death sentence. I mean, you know, what is it, 12, was it, was it Coptic Christians who were beheaded? But the numbers keep going up. Uh, and there are many we don't hear about, of course, but there's a, 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 a number of Egyptian Coptic Christians who were beheaded in, in Libya, right? Recently. I, I, who knows about the, the numbers going around? Maybe it's 21. And there are many more we don't hear about. But, you know, that... Once you're captive, it's a death sentence, really. Yeah. And what Paul's concerned about here is something far worse. Far worse than being taken captive by Boko Haram, by Islamic State, by any group, by anybody. Far worse, because this is about not your physical body, whether your head is attached to your torso. This is about the, your eternal destiny. Yeah. Don't be taken captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. Philosophy, in this context, could be Judaism. It could be the Judaizers, going back to Judaism, going back to the idea of holding on to the law, as well as trying to be a Christian, be a Mosaic Christian, if you like. It could be that idea, because in common, uh, uh, phil uh, Judaism was known as a philosophy. It was called a philosophy in the, in the Greek world at that time. So it could be talking about that. It could be talking about other Greek philosophical ideas, I think either way, what he's talking about is the idea of trying to achieve your salvation by your own efforts. Why? In mosaic, if you like, mosaic, quasi-mosaic Christianity, it was about keeping the law, and then you'll be right with God. Yeah. In Greek philosophy, it was more about living with a clear conscience, doing what was right according to society, and as long as you do these things, you'll be okay. But it's all about human effort. I, I, if Paul has to write that to first century Christians, I dare say from time to time, we slip into the idea that our salvation is about us. It's about our efforts, rather than about being rooted in Christ. Uh, we've got the word here, that the, the, the three words in my translation, the elemental spiritual forces are one word in the Greek, stoikion. Um, that word originally meant um, lining things up in a row. So things like the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, that was a stoikion, that was one example of a row or a line of things. And uh, it seems as if Paul is saying, that's so basic, these elemental spiritual forces, these, these things might have brought you to a knowledge of God, like nature, right? Nature is very much the elemental spiritual, well, elemental forces, which this also carries that idea in the Greek thinking of the day. If that may have brought you to an understanding there is a God, a sunset, the wind, the, I don't know, you know, some of those things help us to under, but that's where you begin. You don't go yeah. back there, you don't go back, you don't say, wow, the sun's amazing, Jesus is even more amazing, but you know what, I'm going to go back and worship the sun, right. Right. the wind and the waves, I, this is going backwards, you don't go backwards, go forward, be built up, don't go back to those kinds of things. I think one question for us to think about in our quiet times, talking together with our friends and our spouses, is what, what kind of philosophies are hollow? What kind of thinking is hollow that I am attracted to? The I, things that I think are going to make me happy in a way that somehow Christianity isn't making me happy. What is it that I think is, I feel is missing? And maybe there's something out there in the world or in some other sort of way of worshipping that is going to make me truly fulfilled. And that actually, when you look at it objectively, 
may be taking you away from your focus on Jesus Christ. That's something to think about. Three brief thoughts, though, as we go through this rest of the passage. That was the introduction. All right, let's speed up a little bit. So, point number one, Christ's identity. How does Paul want to help the Colossians to keep their focus on Christ? Three things. Firstly, have a look at the identity of Jesus Christ, his nature. You've, we've still got things to learn about Jesus. You know that thing when you became a Christian, you thought you knew nearly everything about Jesus. He's the Son of God. He died for my sins. Hallelujah. He raised from the dead, and I'm going to follow him as his disciples. That's fantastic. I'm going to learn a lot, but I don't know if I'm going to learn a lot about Jesus. That's kind of how I felt, to my shame. Maybe you didn't think that way. But I think in the Christian life, we keep learning about him. And he's, he says them, to them here, verse 9, All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. I don't know about you, but that one line is mind-boggling. What does that mean? All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. If I could get my head around that, how strong I'd be in my faith. Eh? Uh, we're growing and learning about this kind of thing. Isn't it great when you keep learning about someone you're a friend with? And you've been friends many, many years, especially if you're married, you know, and you've been married 10 or 20 or 30 years for Penny and I's our 30th wedding anniversary this year. And we're still learning things about each other. We're still surprising each other. And that's a good thing, even if it's uncomfortable sometimes. But it's, it keeps the relationship alive today, as I told you. I was at a funeral, <coughs> excuse me, of my dad's cousin. And uh, there were the three cousins were close. My father, the cousin who died, Brian, and his other cousin called George. And they're all uh, within 10 months of each other in age. And they kind of grew up together in Portsmouth. And George, who I was speaking to today, I know him, but I don't know him terribly well, but I was sitting down with him afterwards at the uh, party sort of thing, sandwiches and all that afterwards. And I, I was talking to George, who must be around 79, 80 years old, and I, I knew he'd been in the MOD when he was uh, younger and working, and I asked him more about what did you do, because I had this memory that one time I asked him what he did when I was a kid, and he said, I can't tell you. Uh, oh, what a great mystery. Now, he's retired, and I'm an adult, I can ask him again, what did you actually do? He said, well, I couldn't tell you while I was doing it, but actually, turns out, my uh, dad's cousin George was in charge of the entire Polaris program. For those of you who remember, the, the, before Trident, there was Polaris. He was in charge of the whole program. After that, he was in charge of the entire, uh, of all the torpedoes in the British Navy. Basically, anything to do with torpedoes was, was on his desk. Uh, after that, he was in charge of the testing of the electrical systems of Trident. And then he was in charge of all the electrical testing of all the submarines in the British Navy. And then he was in charge of the electrical testing of all ships launched in the British Navy, whatever they were. He would go out to the North Sea and do these live tests on all the electrical systems. I was like, man, my dad's cousin was in charge of all torpedoes in the British Navy. I had no idea. I thought I could sit here and talk to him all day. Well, how fascinating this must be. Now, for some of you, I can see you're bored. You know, just, <laughs> nah, nah, maybe torpedoes don't do it for you. That's nah, fine. But I was like, I had no idea. You know, I, I, I want to go see my dad's cousin, George, again. <laughs> but, I mean, that's kind of impressive. I think it's impressive. Yeah. But, come on, there's so much more to learn about Jesus. Yeah. Are, we still tr are we still striving to learn about Jesus? Are we still reading our Bible? 10, 20, 30 years on from our baptism, saying, God, teach me something more about Jesus. Open my heart. Open my mind. Re let me read that gospel again. I had a chat with someone recently who said, I'm a bit bored of the gospels. I've read them so many times. And I think, I, I, I appreciate the honesty of the comment. But then I think, we've got to go back and say, I, am I asking the right questions? Right. I think we learn when we ask questions. We go to the Bible. One of my most helpful things I did about... Um, Three years ago, four, no longer than that, four or five years ago, as I went through the Gospel of Luke, simply looking at the compassion of Jesus. Just that one thing. God, teach me about the compassion of Jesus. And then I went back through the book of Luke saying, God, show me the convictions of Jesus. Let me look at his convictions. I don't know about what it is for you, but maybe you could pick something that would help you spiritually to learn about Jesus and just read one Gospel, study one Gospel, pray through one Gospel, looking for that one thing you'll learn a lot. I think we all do. So let's keep learning. He is deity. The word theotetos uh, doesn't mean he, like he's like God or he has some of God's power, but it means he has, he has the very essence of God right. is the meaning. We are in Christ. How blessed we are to be brought to that fullness. We've come to the source. They used to send out these explorers to try and find the source of the Nile. 
and these people would die of malaria or something while trying to find the source of the Nile. And then they proclaim, we found the source of the Nile. Good for you. Okay, I'm very happy for you. But we've come to the source of everything, which is what this really means. And so we've come to the source, why go back for anything else? Yeah. That this is the source. Everything else just emanates from this source. All pleasures, all happiness, all joys come out of Christ and because of Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. He's the head. He has more power than any other powers over all power, over all authority. It's not just that he's got more power. It's not like, what's the film coming out? Is it Superman versus Batman? Is it? Is it coming out this year? <laughs> so excited. I think Fun Lord is excited. I think. Is it this year? Yeah, it's, it's coming, right? It's coming. It's coming. Okay. Some people are excited. My son told me he's very excited. Superman versus Batman. I, I don't know who's got more power and who's going to win or whether Superman. Either, either Superman. Okay, well. Maybe. I don't, I don't know. But what I do know is it's not that Jesus is more powerful than, it's that he has the authority over all. Amen. It's just, that's, that's all the word there is to it. So therefore, what does that mean for us? Well, I think I've got some questions on your head now. How does that affect your thankfulness? Knowing that you've got to that source. Knowing that you have deity with you. And in fact, in a sense, in you. Because we're in Christ and he's in us. What difference does that make that you know to you, to your thankfulness? To know that Christ is the essence of God. What difference does it make to your thankfulness that Christ is head over every power and authority? So that's one thing. That helps us in our thankfulness. The second thing, other than the identity of Christ, is our own faith. Paul talks about our own faith here in verses uh, uh, 11 uh, and 12. Uh, we, we've had this spiritual circumcision. The world has been taken off us. Uh, we're not in that world anymore. Uh, we've been buried with him in baptism, in which we were also raised with him through our faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. What a wonderful thing. Uh, there's two things we can see that we have done there. We have been obedient. Uh, I think it's a great thing to celebrate the fact that we have decided to follow Christ, to be obedient to his teachings. I, I don't think wrong with saying amen. I'm, I'm glad I made that decision. We've been obedient to uh, repentance and to baptism. And one of the things that helps our thankfulness is going back and reflecting upon our baptism. Yeah, yeah. Reflecting upon that time and that day, <laughs> what God did for us. And that our faith... Uh, in Christ, that he uh, forgave our sins, that he washed them away, that he gave us the Holy Spirit, that we're raised to a new life like Christ was raised from the dead. Our faith in that fact uh, means that we have life in Christ. That's what we have. We have newness of life. We haven't got time to look at the extra references in Romans, but you either know them or you will when you look them up later. <laughs> so, it's a wonderful thing. Um, one thing I did when I was a younger Christian a few times is on the anniversary of my baptism, I went back to the place where I was baptized and had an all-night prayer. And uh, I, I drove, I got baptized in Bermondsey in southeast London. And uh, I, 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 a few, several times I got in my car and I would drive down there. I didn't live there. I drove down there and I sat outside and I'd pray. Or I'd walk around the area if it was warm enough. And I, it, was, uh, it was just a great thing to go there. And it's, it's just a building. It's just a building, you know. But, but it's where it all happened for me. And when I went there, you know how when you visualize things or you have something that brings a memory back? Uh, I, I, I do now and again pray and visualize my baptism and remember as much as I can. It was 30 years ago, but as much as I can remember, I remember. And I visualize. I close my eyes. And I, I'm there with Chris McGrath and, and Fred Scott and, and other people. And, I, and in fact, Caroline must have been there. I think, uh -huh. I think Caroline, I'm sure, was there. And, and I, I visualize being there. Tim, Tim must have been there. Yes, Tim was there. That's right. And Archie Kendall was there. And, and I visualize it. And I remember some certain things about what happened and how I felt and what it was just... Ah, but going to the building, going and standing out, walking around outside, oh, it's so much more powerful. I'd like to encourage you, maybe, one way to overflow with thankfulness is to take some time to either go somewhere special that reminds you, maybe it was somewhere near here, you got baptized to the river, to a pond, to somebody's bath. Maybe go there. If it's somebody else's house and their bath, get permission before you go around. But, but, but nonetheless, go there. Or just close your eyes one day in your quiet time and take yourself back there and remember why did I do what I did? I think that will help you to overflow with thankfulness. It certainly helps me when I do that. So that's what we did. And then finally, God's work. Verses 13 to 15. What did he do? He made us alive with Christ. Amen. Alive with Christ. Why is this so significant? Because Jesus is still alive. 
you remember when he rose from the dead, he was then ascended into heaven as an alive human being and God. So he still lives. He still stands in heaven for there interceding for us. He still lives. And so he made us alive with Christ, and that helps us remember that the life that Christ has eternally is ours, though yet we are still in this world and will be fully ours when we are with him in the next life. But there's a connection, there's a thread, there's a well, more than a thread, there's an anchor to the soul as the song goes. There's, there's a connection that cannot be broken by sin, death, demons, the enemy, any powers, any authorities, even our own weaknesses cannot break that. You can walk away from it, you can let go of it, but Christ holds on to us, I think, quite often a lot more strongly than we actually think. We don't feel it, we, we struggle, but actually his hold on us is pretty tight because we mean so much to him. And so we are in, we are alive in, in him. And what did he do? He forgave us all our sins. A double L. Three letters, one very important word. All our sins. Now, not, not just the ones from 20 years ago, not just the ones from five years ago, but the ones from this morning, the ones from 20 minutes ago, the, the ones of tomorrow, and the ones of next week, and all. This is not a time-dependent word here. This is all our life, all our sins. What an amazing thing. And these sins have been dealt with. They've been, the, 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 he's cancelled the charge, the legal indebtedness, the word then, the Greek, exalapsas, causing something to cease by obliterating any evidence. Wow. <laughs> obliterating every evidence. He hasn't just cancelled the debt and you've still got the statement. You know, like you've got your bank statement. It's not just, you know, cancelled, now the debt is zero. The, the whole thing has ceased to exist. The statement, the bank account, maybe even the bank. I don't know, but the whole thing's just gone. It's like if CSI did, did an episode, it would be the worst episode ever. Because they'd come along with their microscopes and their fibre things and they'd find absolutely nothing. And everybody would go home. Not much of a good episode that week. It, that's what he did for us. Cancelled it, obliterated it. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the written, the, uh, the, the stood against us, condemned us, and condemned us. It stood against us and condemned us. It's a chirographon, a written code, an IOU. Isn't it great when someone forgives you your debts? Yeah. Yeah. If I had someone just say, Dear, just write it off. Uh, I, I had a nice, expe a nice experience today because it's my sister's 50th birthday on Sunday. And uh, so that was great. And she turned 50. And, uh, and I, it was my birthday the day before, because I'm four years and one day younger than my sister. So it's my birthday on a Saturday, hers on a Sunday. My parents, I saw today at the funeral, my dad said, we'll give you your birthday present at the funeral. I said, okay, so I, I saw him at the funeral. He gave me this little card, and in the card, I opened the card, and there inside there was a check. I thought, thank you very much, that's nice. I looked at the check, and it was somewhat larger that I'm used to receiving from my parents for my birthday. They're always generous. I'm not saying they're mean. I'm just saying it was a bit bigger than I expected. And they'd written a note in there. And what they had done is, for my sister's 50th birthday, they cancelled a debt that she had to them. They helped fund her MA. She did an MA uh, about so two years ago. And they helped fund that. They lent her some money. And uh, they just forgave the debt for her 50th. And it was, you know, it was a chunk of money. And so they decided they wanted to be fair to my sister and to me. Wow. Wow. Amen. Wow. So they wrote me a check for the same amount. Wow. I was like, fantastic. <laughs> I must get my sister to do a PhD now. <laughs> That's all going to burn, you know. <laughs> I mean, really, it is. And, but what, what we've been forgiven, this debt has been cancelled. Oh, my goodness. This, the, the blessings of that, the, the, the things that come with that, the sweetness of the joys of eternal life with Christ and with one another, that's still to come and it lasts forever. No, no wonder Paul is saying, let's, let me show you how to overflow with thankfulness. By showing you, about, reminding you of Christ's identity, reminding you what your faith has achieved you, and reminding you about what God has done for you. Now you share in the triumph, the public spectacle over the powers and authorities, the triumph. You were prisoners, now you're free. A great irony. Paul himself, as he writes this, is a prisoner <coughs> of Rome, shackled with chains, and yet reminding the, the Colossians, you are free and you share in the victory parade. What an amazing thing. Yeah.
Uh, I pray it's been a blessing to us all. Uh, we have fullness in Christ. Let's continue to learn about it, study it, think about it, discuss it with one another. Because what we have is so incredible. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Amen.